Kicking off at number five, Tourist Trap, 1979. Ma'am. <laughs> and although this film looks very much like a stereotypical run of the mill B movie, and although it pretty much is exactly that, strangely enough, it's also kind of really good. And also, it's one of the weirdest films to have emerged from the late 70s, and believe me, that's saying something. I guarantee that the first time you watch this film, you'll have no idea what the hell you've been watching. Also, if like me, you have a fear of the uncanny and strange mannequins suddenly springing to life, is nightmare fuel enough, then you'll for sure be getting your money's worth with this film, if being scared senseless is in your bag of tricks, of course. I mean, I'm guessing that it is. You're watching a list video about horror movies, but whatever. For all intents and purposes, Taurus Trap is a run-of-the-mill slasher film. Travelling group of friends, their car breaks down, find themselves at a strange roadside establishment, and then of course, that's when the weirdness begins. Because it's really weird. <laughs> because although this film is very much a standard slasher, the manner in which the slasher-ing is orchestrated is something else entirely. And I'll warn you, if you're looking for this film to adhere to any form of logic, please don't, because logic flies out the window like a barrage of telekinetic mannequin limbs. Yeah. Written and directed by David Schmuller, Tourist Trap tells a tale of a group of friends on a road trip who quickly come into car troubles in the stereotypical manner and seek shelter for the evening in a tourist trap operated by the strange Mr. Slauson. And really, that's all there is to it, because quicker than a rat up a drain pipe, an entire museum's worth of mannequins dressed in all manners of historical garb then become the means for a very unexpected blood Bath. Although it doesn't sound like it, this film needs to be seen to be believed. It is so obscure, so spooky in its off the wall manner. It should be formulaic, but it's not that at all. It's bizarre in all the right places. Listen, if I haven't sold you already on this film, just Give it a watch. If you're looking for a weird film, there are few weirder than Tourist Trap. Swinging in at number four, Gozu, 2003. There's weird, and then there's Takeshi Miike weird. And yeah, I know I'll never fully live down the whole Takeshi Mike ordeal, but come on, mistakes build character, guys. I'm sorry. Now, if we look back through the entire catalogue of Miike's work, there are some absolutely astonishing pieces of cinema, horror aside. Audition, for one, a pretty weird film for the most part, if not terrifying. Ichi the Killer, an absolutely insane onslaught of cinema, but awesome nonetheless. And then there's Gozu, perhaps one of the weirdest films ever made. However, there's weird for the sake of being weird, and then there's weird for the sake of creating a straight up fantastic movie. And thankfully for us, 2003's Gozu falls in the latter camp. Put it this way, in its native Japanese, this film translates literally to Yakuza Horror Theatre, Cow's Head. It tells a tale of Azaki, a member of the Yakuza in the midst of a mental breakdown, and his brother in crime, Minami, caught between doing the right thing by his friend and being a gangster. For all intents and purposes, this film could come off like a stereotypical Yakuza movie. In many ways, it is a crime drama, although it's also a comedy, and also a horror, and also shocking and bizarre and perplexing, but Hey, it's a Takeshi Miike movie, right? He can get away with it. And whilst that mashup may sound a little bit familiar, that's because in many ways it is. Miike has been incredibly vocal about his stylistic intention with Gozu, and for the most part, this film is very clear in its sentimental direction. For the sum of its moving limbs, Gozu is intentionally made out to be a film similar to the works of David Lynch. It's dreamlike, it's surreal, but where Lynch often finds logic in his nightmares, there is no logic to this film. And whilst that may come across as a bit of a failure, I disagree. Beginning to end, it is a tour de force of weird. This film may frustrate a few people and perhaps can come off as a little bit boring in places, particularly for conventional horror fans, but in all honesty, Gozu is just something else entirely. When it comes to weird, it's in a league of its own. Coming in at number three, Traces of Death. Released in 1993 and directed by Damon Fox, Traces of Death is a Z-movie mondo shockumentary that consists of various scenes of stock footage depicting death and real scenes of violence. Unlike the movie Faces of Death, which included fake deaths and reenactments, Traces is for the most part real and consists of public domain footage depicting death and injury. As you would expect, the movie was met with rejection all across the globe. And 
in 2005 the BBFC refused to give the first film an age certificate, effectively banning it. They deemed the movie to have no journalistic, educational or other justifying content for the images shown, while also suggesting that the film could potentially breach the UK laws under the Obscene Publications Act. The entire series has been subject to confiscation by customs authorities in Australia, and according to the country's regulations, I quote, they offend against the standards of morality, decency and propriety generally accepted by reasonable adults to the extent that they should not be imported. Honestly, this film is absolutely disgusting and should never be watched. Coming in at 2, Henry Portrait of a Serial Killer. Released in 1986 and directed by John McNaughton, Henry Portrait of a Serial Killer is a psychological horror about the random crime spree of a serial killer who seemingly operates with impunity. The film was, as expected, quite controversial. In the UK, the film has had a long and complex relationship with our friends the BBFC, with them refusing certification for many years. Now, the film's production company didn't even want to give the movie a theatrical release, which is a surprise, leaving the director to personally send out screener copies to critics in hopes of drumming up buzz. However, no one was willing simply because the MPAA gave the movie an X rating, which at the time was mostly reserved for porno films. The film has heavy, heavy violence, which actually aided in the creation of the NC-17 rating, a distinction for movies with extreme content that don't quite cross the line into porn. But you may be asking, what happened to the film in Australia and New Zealand? Well, the film was originally outright banned by the film censor in 1992. A censored version was subsequently released on home video with cuts to the family massacre sequence, and was released on DVD in 2005. Look at the world. It's either you or them. You know what I mean. And finally coming in at number 1, The Last House on the Left. Released in 1972 and directed by the legendary Wes Craven, The Last House on the Left is an exploitation horror film that revolves around two teenage girls who were taken into the woods and tortured by a gang of murderous thugs. Now, this movie was actually Craven's directorial debut and was loosely inspired by Ingmar Bergman's The Virgin Spring, and in turn received vicious censoring, resulting in it being banned in certain countries for decades. The film was explicit, particularly the torture scene, and therefore the United Kingdom refused a certificate for cinema release by the BBFC in 1974 due to the scenes of sadism and violence. The film was ultimately banned throughout the remainder of the 1980s and into the 1990s. However, after a series of major cuts, the movie is now available for viewing. That itself didn't happen until 2008. To top it off, no one even bothered to attempt to distribute it in Australia due to the monumental problems it would have caused. It actually wasn't even released down under until 2004. How crazy is that? The New York Times critics Howard Thompson even admitted to walking out after just 50 minutes of this sickening tripe. Fun fact for you all, when it was no longer banned, my parents bought it for me. <laughs> Merry Christmas. Kicking off at number five, Willow Creek, 2013. Crazy. Pets and people go missing all the time. I'll go in there myself. You can just stay here in town if you want. You believe any nut job out there that says Sasquatch is real? And for our first brush with folklore in horror cinema, we're heading over to North America with perhaps one of the most legendary paranormal creatures and sources of forestry urban legend, Bigfoot. And while you may think that Bigfoot has historically been more miss than hit in horror cinema, this film definitely has something to say about that. Written and directed by Bobcat Goldthwait in his first ever foray into horror cinema, Willow Creek is your standard indie found footage handheld horror about Bigfoot lore and is heavily influenced by the legendary Patterson Gimlin footage of 1967. However, while on the surface this film definitely doesn't do anything new and it doesn't exactly break any new ground for horror cinema, as we step through the woods of Northern California, the folklore of the Sasquatch and Bigfoot has never been more real. Willow Creek tells a tale of Jim and his long-suffering girlfriend Kelly. Jim is a fanatic believer of Bigfoot lore and an avid amateur cryptozoologist in pursuit of the big hairy unknown. In classic found footage fashion, Jim's idea of a romantic getaway is to head into the Six Rivers National Forest and hopefully find the infamous dry sandbar deep in the woods where the Patterson Gimlin footage was shot and film the whole thing along the way. It's a simple premise with a relatively simple interpretation of folklore. Bigfoot is just a giant hairy elusive humanoid that lives deep in the wild, right? Well, Willow Creek definitely believes that, but it has a lot more to say about the implications of the unknown. I'll say no more because whilst this film is short and straightforward in its approach, it also packs in so much more and expands upon an already intriguing folklore. Also, 
mark my words, the last few frames of this film will make your hair stand on end in some way or another. Coming in at number four, Borgman, 2013. And for our next entry, we'll be heading over to the mysteries and dark fantasies of Germanic folklore. And whilst this film isn't exactly the most clear-cut interpretation of a fairy tale, its mechanics are a much more modern description of an age-old fear. 2013's Borgman isn't exactly the clearest or most obvious of horror films. In fact, in many ways, it's a film that relies on the psychology of fear to land its punches. But it's in the surrealism of this horror movie where things really get interesting. Written and directed by Dutch filmmaker Alex van Vormedam, Borgman paints the intriguing picture of a mysterious homeless man. It goes by many names throughout the film, but in all reality, he is none other than an Alp, the nightmare demon of Germanic folklore. In the oral traditions of Central European society, the old High German creature, the Alp, was likened to an often malevolent nature god or demon, similar to that of a fawn that would later be morphed into the elves of Celtic and Scandinavian lore. In Borgman, this simple formula gets a much more modern retelling, as the mysterious homeless man, otherwise known as Anton, gets chased out of his underground home deep in the wilderness by a priest and two armed men where he seeks refuge in a wealthy family's home. And then, as we expect, things take a much more mystical turn. I won't say any more because Borgman is a surprisingly shocking film and the final act of this movie is pure evil. It's almost like Michael Haneke's funny games just with an ancient Germanic Alp instead. And that's what makes it great. Coming in at number three, The Human Centipede 2 Full Sequence. The Human Centipede 2 is notorious for being one of the most disgusting films of all time, not to mention having one of the most foul smelling concepts, as well as a decreasing level of artistry throughout the installment. However, number two takes the cake for being one of the most abhorrent and nihilistic movies I have ever watched in my entire life. It is beyond gross out, it is mentally and emotionally scarring. The film centers on a depraved man who goes on a killing spree in order to recreate the experiment portrayed in the human centipede. The movie itself was so extreme that the film was initially refused classification by the BBFC saying, I quote, No amount of cuts would make the movie acceptable enough to be exhibited or sold. They also raised the possibility that the film could be in violation of the nation's Obscene Publications Act, which the director Tom Six responded to, I quote, Apparently I made a horrific horror film, but shouldn't a good horror film be horrific? My dear people, it is a f***ing movie. The movie was eventually approved for release after undergoing two and a half minutes of cuts. The movie as it stands is banned in New Zealand, however the third movie wasn't banned anywhere at all surprisingly. And I think that's just because it was sh Coming in at number 2, Necromantic 1 and 2. Directed by Jörg Butgeret and released in 1987, Necromantic follows a street sweeper who cleans up after grisly accidents, and after he brings home a full corpse for him and his wife to enjoy sexually, he is dismayed to discover his wife prefers the corpse over him. Savage. Now, this film, aside from our number 1 point, is perhaps the most disgusting movie out there, with the movie containing acts of necrophilia and animal cruelty in abundance. Now, unlike like a lot of movies on our list, these disturbing moments had a purpose, but still, it was tough to swallow, considering these scenes of sex with corpses were used to creatively further a story of elite oppression and class struggle. Due to this, the movie was banned in Iceland, Norway, Malaysia, Singapore, New Zealand, Finland, Australia, and a handful of provinces in Canada. Now, the film itself was actually made specifically to protest government censorship, but despite this, the movie faced no real opposition in its home country of Germany. Until sales became restricted a few years later. Although the reaction from German authorities to the first Necromantic was relatively muted, the release of the sequel Necromantic 2 certainly made up for it, with the authorities raiding theatres that screened the movie and confiscated prints, making any possession of the film a punishable act. And finally coming in at number 1, a Serbian film. Released in 2010, a Serbian film follows an aging porn star who's struggling to provide for his family. So he agrees to make one last film, unbeknownst to him, it contains themes of pedophilia, necrophilia, and may end with his death. A Serbian film has over time gained a reputation worldwide for being one of the most extreme and disturbing horror movies ever made, and I can confirm it is horrific. Some of the most horrific moments include the assault of a newborn baby, sex with corpses, and the assault 
guilt of the protagonist's own child. And that is me putting it tamely. This film is absolutely revolting and should be witnessed by no one. Saying that, it is not surprising in the slightest that it has been banned in Germany, Norway, Brazil, Australia, New Zealand, Malaysia, Spain and Singapore, with the countries that allowed for the movies release requiring the movie to undergo censorship cuts, and a lot of them. Following a Serbian films ban in Spain, the director of a film festival faced criminal charges for daring to show the movie, with the accusation being that the screening constituted exhibition of child pornography. The case was such an overreach in general that the film's director claimed, I quote, those prosecutors have no clue what child pornography actually means, and added that the sequences weren't made to be arousing in any way, but to depict the pure horror and brutality of innocence being ruthlessly defiled. Fair point, but still, the film is too extreme for most people, including me. Kicking off at number five, a lizard in a woman's skin, 1971. For those of you that don't know, Giallo cinema was a very specific style of Italian horror, particularly tied to the mid to late 1960s, which often employed murder mystery tropes with dramatic suspense building, peaked with burst of slasher violence and fantasy eroticism. It's not for everyone, but it had a massive impact on later American slasher horror, and perhaps one of the most intriguing examples of giallo cinema is 1971's A Lizard in a Woman's Skin, directed and written by Lucio Fulci. Well, as chance would have it, legendary special effects artist Carlo Rambaldi was actually tied to this film before his work on Steven Spielberg's E.T., and his eye for visual nasties was so convincing that it actually landed the director in an Italian criminal court. During the events of the film, the lead character Carol finds herself wrapped up in an LSD fueled crime story involving murderous dreams and mind bending altercations, and at one point finds herself confronted with four vivisected dogs, their chests open and their hearts still beating. The physical effects were so convincing that the courts charged Lucio Fulci with animal cruelty, and the director faced a two year prison sentence. In the end, Carlo Rambaldi had to present the animatronic creations in front of a court where the charges were eventually dropped. Now that's a close call. Coming in at number four, Guinea Pig, Flowers of Flesh and Blood, 1985. Perhaps one of the most controversial depictions of horror cinema in the whole of Japanese history, if not the rest of the world. The guinea pig films are a series of six Japanese horror films from the early 1980s and 90s, based off of the filmmaker Hideshi Hino's own horror manga series of a similar nature that depicts incredibly graphic and grotesque Japanese body horror and violence. Now listen, this style of horror cinema isn't really for me, but fringe filmmaking has often pushed the boundaries so that the mainstream can further develop the genre as a whole. But on the on the flip side, Hideshi Hino's work had a pretty rough time, to say the least, and the filmmaker had to constantly prove that no one was actually hurt or murdered during production. While in a bizarre turn of events that involved Charlie Sheen, of all people, it had the guinea pig series being investigated by the FBI. In 1991, actor Charlie Sheen was given a copy of the second film in the series, Flowers of Flesh and Blood, and after watching it, Sheen mistook it for a genuine snuff film, claiming that the graphic depictions on screen were so lifelike that there was no way special effects could have pulled it off. He was so convinced that he contacted the FBI to report it, only to find that they were in fact already investigating the filmmakers, who were then summoned to a Japanese court to prove that the special effects were fake. <sighs> Must have been all of that tiger blood. Next up at number three, Noroi, The Curse, 2005. Now, this is for sure an interesting film, to say the least, and it's a welcome sore thumb in the world of Japanese horror. It comes from renowned director Koji Shirashi, who's made quite the name for himself as a found footage auteur, with films like Occult and Shirome, a departure from the short and settling style often found in J horror. Naroi is perhaps the best example of his work, and it stands out as a slow burning mockumentary of paranormal investigation in Japan. Naroi features an absolutely mammoth task, interweaving several 
storylines that lead up to a deeply disturbing ending. For the most part though, it focuses on Masafumi Kobayashi, a paranormal expert famous for uncovering supernatural mysteries and his investigation of a strange woman and her young son. It manages to give us just enough to keep the mystery going, and I don't say this lightly, pretty much every scene is unsettling as we quickly realise that there are much more malevolent powers at play. Swinging in at number 2, The Blair Witch Project, 1999. And you just knew this one would make this list, didn't you? Of course, perhaps the most famous found footage horror film of all time, and many people's first horrific dive into the subgenre. The Blair Witch Project is an awesome horror film, I'm gonna say it, and the impact they had on the genre as a whole can't be denied. The reason that the Blair Witch Project is so damn good is because it managed to pull off exactly what terrifies us. A stark reminder that what really scares us is the stuff that we can't see, especially in a time when horror cinema was trying its hardest to deliver full frontal fear. Again, like with the McPherson tape, the Blair Witch Project relied heavily on viral marketing. Even a year after its release, the three actors, Heather Donahue, Joshua Leonard and Michael C. Williams, were listed on their IMDb pages as missing or deceased. The film's creators, Daniel Myrick and Eduardo Sanchez, made huge strides in creating a working mythology for the film, drawing on 18th century folk legends to fabricate their own occultist backdrop, hinting to the viewer that perhaps there was some truth to the events of the film. In essence, it's what makes found footage horror so good when it's done well. An uneasy mix between horror fiction and horror fact. And finally, our number one spot, The Borderlands 2013. Also known as Final Prayer in the US, but come on, the original title is so much better. The Borderlands is a 2013 British horror film written and directed by Elliot Goldner in his directorial debut. I'm going to say it, this film is awesome for many reasons, but the main reason is that it answers a question that somewhat mires the believability of found footage horror. Why are they still filming? Well, The Borderlands has a pretty decent answer for that. Three men who were sent by the Vatican to provide evidence of demonic occurrences in a remote church in rural Britain. I really, really don't want to spoil anything in this film because I sincerely urge you to watch it if you haven't. But, but in my opinion, this is one of the best found footage horror films of recent times. It's equal parts The Wicker Man and equal parts The Exorcist, and it's an awesome display of British folk horror, an emerging subgenre that is really hitting the mark for this particular horror fan. Really, guys, I can't say much more other than just watch this one because it's really really good. Coming in at 5, Cannibal Holocaust. Released in 1980 and directed by Ruggero Diodato, this movie centers on a rescue mission into the Amazon rainforest, which results in a surprising discovery when a professor stumbles across lost film shot by a missing documentary crew, whose goal was to study the region's indigenous cannibalistic tribes. Now, Cannibal Holocaust was one of the very first found footage horror movies which actually led to the director being arrested for suspicion of murder. Now, what makes this movie so disgusting is the fact that actual animals were killed on screen, making the fake deaths of the humans more believable. In order to sell the illusion, the actors' contracts prevented them from appearing in any other TV shows or movies for a year after its release, in order to sell the fact they were supposed to be dead. Now, this eventually came back to haunt the director, who was arrested by Italian authorities shortly after the movie's premiere in Milan on charges of obscenity and suspicion of making a snuff film. The director was forced to demonstrate the movie's special effects, as well as confirm that the actors were in fact still alive. The real animal killings, however, still led to the film being banned by the authorities, a judgement that was echoed by Australia, Norway, Finland and New Zealand. Coming in at number 4, Sallow or 120 Days of Sodom. This movie, released back in 1975, centers on a group of fascists who round up 9 adolescent boys and girls and subject them to 120 days of physical, mental and sexual torture. The movie as a whole is a metaphor for fascism and abuse by the state. The movie is perhaps one of the most disturbing and horrifically explicit movies of all time. It's the type of movie you watch on accident and never return to again. You may even talk to a therapist about it, like me. 
<laughs> For decades after its release, it was banned in the United Kingdom and New Zealand, and was mostly banned in Australia up until 2010. Now, although it was never explicitly banned in the United States, it was involved in the arrest of the owners of a Cincinnati based bookstore in 1994 after police bought the movie as part of a questionable sting operation. The case, however, was dismissed before a court could determine if the film violated obscenity laws. As of right now, the movie is available in a high definition transcript. Transfer from the Criterion Collection, but I implore you not to watch it. Honestly, it shook me to my core. Next up at number three, Black Sheep, 2006. Oh no. Now, several of you may be thinking, what the hell is this film doing here? Surely there are weirder films than New Zealand's 2006 horror comedy Black Sheep, and I'd say bear to that because there aren't. Why do I do this to myself? Why? Because it's zombie sheep. That's why. And the fact of the matter is, I kind of want this list to be worthwhile as well. Because when it comes to weird, there's no point investing a few hours into a film if it's not going to be entertaining. And Black Sheep is one of the most deceivingly entertaining horror films of the past decade. Put it this way, in New Zealand, sheep outnumber human beings by around 7 to 1. And with that ratio, how would the human population fare in a sheep zombie outbreak? Yeah, you can see where we go in this one, right? But what begins as a stereotypical B-movie tongue-in-cheek slasher quickly becomes a horror onslaught of a different kind of magnitude. Written and directed by Jonathan King, Black Sheep tells the tale of Henry, who as a child is scared witless by his older brother Angus dressed in a sheep costume that traumatises him for life, leaving him with a lifelong fear of sheep. Obviously, in their adult lives, Angus now runs a highly successful sheep farm, and Henry has lived the rest of his life traumatised by fear, far, far away from the countryside. But then, even more obviously, that's where it turns out that Angus has been conducting genetic experiments on his sheep, and when Henry has to return to his childhood home to sell his share of the farm, that's where the real action begins. Listen, the premise of this film is weird, but that's where the book stops, because 2006's Black Sheep is actually a fantastic horror film. It's also hilarious, and some of the one-liners in this film would give Shaun of the Dead a run for its money. Also, this film is gory, and some of the special effects in this film are absolutely disgusting in ways only that a sheep tearing out a person's intestines can ever be. Yeah, exactly. Black sheep, weird, but also great. Coming in at number two, Phantasm, 1979. Even for the most die-hard fans of the legendary cult classic Phantasm, as well as its further franchise, there's no denying that the reason this horror series is so beloved is down to the fact that it is so damn weird you can't help but enjoy it. And whilst the later entries of the series are without a doubt the weirdest of the weird, the first entry in the franchise, 1979's Phantasm, laid the seed for one of horror's most underappreciated darlings. Put it this way, for those of you that don't know, Phantasm is the first introduction of the iconic tall man, played by Angus Scrim, a supernatural dimension hopping undertaker who turns the dead of Earth into dwarf zombies to then be sent to his home planet and used as slaves. Yeah, and that's just the start of it, because it only serves to get weirder. Written and directed by Don Coscarelli, Phantasm has often been described as a film that intentionally doesn't make any sense. And whilst that's partially true, that's a little bit of a cop-out, because I think the fairer way of describing it is that Phantasm intentionally doesn't make any sense to conventional horror. It's weird, but not for the sake of being weird. It's weird because Don Coscarelli wanted to do things his way. And that is the reason why it works. It's like delving into someone's fever dream without them knowing, or like one of those incredible incredibly realistic daydreams that you just can't wake up from. It tells the tale of a young kid named Mike who witnesses the supernatural actions of the tall man, a figure that serves as the mortician for the small town of Morningside, and slowly figures to put two and two together to realise that the tall man is something else entirely. And the departed of Mike's young town aren't exactly being laid to rest, but something else is happening. In many ways, Phantasm is as giallo as they come. There are very few explanations in terms of narrative, but then it's also gonzo, and it's a little bit punk. It's horror DIY in all the right places, and then before you know it, you're faced with some surprisingly awesome low budget physical effects and floating metal spheres start drilling people's brains out. The tall man is often lauded as a horror icon, and rightly so, but if you want to see how to make an awesomely weird horror movie crafted with love that doesn't have to make any sense because it doesn't have to, then Phantasm is the film for you. And finally, coming in at number one spot, House 1977. Oh, 
boy, is this film weird. This film is so weird, I don't really know where to begin. Much like Phantasm, every once in a blue moon, a horror film comes along that is so frighteningly original that you can't help but stare in awe at how weird and wonderful it truly is. You see, music is very much the same, and 1977's House could be comparable to Captain Beefheart's 1969 album, Trout Mask Replica. It doesn't make any sense, it shouldn't make any sense, but somehow, through all of the cacophony of things and non-things and weird little standout moments, it makes perfect sense. I think. Kind of. Put it this way, this film came to life after the film company Toho approached its director to make a film similar to Jaws. And their response to that was to make a film about a demonic house. <laughs> yeah, here we go guys. Directed by Nobuhiko Obayasha on a script inspired by his daughter Chigumi, House tells the tale of a schoolgirl and her six classmates who take a trip to her aunt's strange dilapidated country home where one by one the girls are consumed by the house. <sighs> Yeah, and that's pretty much the entire film, and that's also just the start of it. You see, the thing is, this film is hard to recommend to anyone in regard to sitting down and enjoying a horror movie. As a horror experience though, it's the definition of the term. Start to finish, this film is a series of increasingly bizarre moments, strung together in some kind of semi-coherent childhood fantasy, like a young girl skipping through a forest and then unwittingly ending up in the clutches of her demonic aunt and her cat. This film is the visual definition of the bizarre brilliance of Japanese folklore. It's yokai. It's a cautionary tale behind the subtle idiosyncrasies of Japanese culture. For the most part, it looks like it was made by a child, and that's intentional. It's a trip, and when it comes to weird, there are few as weird as 1977's house. Seriously, it's one hell of a bloodbath, but also strangely charming. It's a visual oddity, and when it comes to weird, it's for sure at the top of the pile. Kicking off at number five, the McPherson tape, 1998. Kurt. Kurt, they're on the roof. Kurt, what are we gonna do, man? We're on the roof. Oh, uh, close the flue. Also known as Alien Abduction Incident in Lake County, the McPherson tape is an incredible display of science fiction horror done well, in a time when the fan footage subgenre was just finding its feet. I'll be honest with you guys, when I first saw the McPherson tape as a kid, when it was broadcast as a straight to TV film, I thought it was actually real. And I wasn't alone either, because when it originally aired on UPN on January 18th, 1998, hundreds of people called in to verify that it wasn't actually portraying real life events. So much so that the late County Sheriff's Department had to release a statement reassuring viewers that the events didn't take place. The McPherson tape centers around a family of the same name who have gathered together for Thanksgiving at their lake house when things quickly and mysteriously go wrong. As usual, I don't want to spoil any plot points for this film because it's definitely worth a watch, but if you're terrified of the thought of little green men roaming around your house at night, then you'll definitely be a fan of this film. Coming in at number four, The House is October Built, 2014. And yeah, this film is great fun, and so damn creepy for the most part. Directed by Bobby Rowe alongside hit producer Steven Schneider, the man behind the original Paranormal Activity, Insidious and The Devil Inside, The House's October Built is a fantastic spin on the fan photo genre, and features some genuinely terrifying set pieces throughout. It gives you that weird sense of dread that the subgenre tries so wholeheartedly to capture, but this film does it to perfection in parts. The House's October Built focuses on a group of friends, all horror fans, may I add, travelling throughout southern USA in the lead up to Halloween. They've got an obsession with live action haunted house attractions and the film plays out as a kind of mini road trip, ramping up the fake scares as it plays out. But while well, the fake scares quickly turn into real scares and the second half of the movie really manages to turn up the heat. The strength of this film is how personal it feels. There's no wider scope other than the events that unfold before us and it's backed up by a genuinely believable cast and likeable characters, which makes the ending that much more bleak. Give it a watch. Swinging in at number three, August Underground, 2001. <laughs> All right. Let's not beat around the bush. This film isn't for me. And after speaking to a few of you in the comment section a few months back, it's not for most people, really. Although there is something to be said about director Fred Vogel's audacity to actually make this film, and the fact that August Underground was even made is worthy of a commendation. Vogel intended to make the most messed up film he possibly could, and he did exactly that. Written, directed, and produced by Fred Vogel, with a writing credit going to his off-screen supporting actor Alan Peters, August Underground depicts the exploits of a serial killer named Peter 
Peter Mountain while being filmed by his unseen accomplice. The thing is though, Fred Vogel's sadistic cinematic interpretation was a little too real for some. While travelling to Canada to attend the Rue Morgue Festival of Fear in Toronto, Vogel was arrested at the airport pending charges of transporting obscene materials into Canada after copies of August Underground and its sequels were found by customs officials that he intended to sell at the convention. Vogel was held for roughly 10 hours in customs prison while his films were sent to Ottawa for analysis. Eventually he was released without charge and ultimately Vogel probably got the reaction that he was actually hoping for all along. Next up at number 2, Snuff, 1976. Ladies and gentlemen, the bloodiest thing that ever happened in front of a camera. Snuff. <laughs> And much like August Underground, the creators of Snuff actually made this film with the intention of convincing people that it was real, in what proved to be one of the most calamitous and opportunistic turns of events in horror history. In 1971, notorious grindhouse husband and wife duo Michael and Roberta Finley had made a low budget exploitation film known as Slaughter, filmed in Argentina on a budget of $30,000. And well, obviously it was terrible and suffered a string of limited releases until it was picked up by Alan Shackleton, an independent low budget film distributor where he kept it in his archive for four years. Until 1976 when the urban legend of snuff cinema was at its highest peak and Shackleton figured he could cash in. He later retitled it snuff as well as refilming the entire ending, this time depicting what appeared to be a real murder after the filmmakers had supposedly finished rolling. The audience saw the crew members brutally murdered the film's lead actress before cutting to black and removing the film's credits. To add insult, it was also marketed with the tagline, the film that could only be made in South America where life is cheap. And well, it worked. The public genuinely believed that it was a snuff movie and contained video evidence of a murder. So much so that Shackleton and crew were investigated by the district attorney of New York, who wasn't appeased until he actually saw the lead actress alive and well. Obviously she was alive, but still, I'd consider that. A pretty close call. And finally, our number one spot, Cannibal Holocaust 1980. And it has to be, really, perhaps the most notorious exploitation film of all time that eventually saw the film's creator, Ruggiero Diodato, charged with multiple counts of murder after its release in 1980. Cannibal Holocaust is a title synonymous with exactly how far filmmakers can push the boundaries of cinematic violence and depravity, but in the end it has proved to be a retrospection of the ethics of journalism, the exploitation of developing countries and the nature of an expansive society versus indigenous peoples. Also noted as one of the most important found footage films of all time, Cannibal Holocaust depicts a multi-layered narrative, initially focusing on a team of film crew members who go missing in an area of the Amazon rainforest known as the Green Inferno, a title later used by Eli Roth in his own homage to Diodato's work. After its release, the world was so shocked by the depiction of graphic violence that the vast majority of the public were convinced it was real, exacerbated by a rumour that several actors had indeed been killed on camera whilst filming. Of course, Diodato was eventually cleared of all charges after the film's actors finally appeared in a television interview, but the legacy of Cannibal Holocaust lived on. Kicking off at number 5, Terrified, 2017. Written and directed by Argentinian horror aficionado Dimian Rugna, this film was first released under its Argentinian title of Aterrados and later under its English name of Terrified. And well it kind of does what it says on the tin because if you're in the business for checking under your bed for ghouls and monsters then that's exactly what you'll get here. I will admit I did have a few gripes with this film mainly due to its lack of pacing. It takes a hot minute to get to the point and then it's just a kind of non-stop barrage but I will also note that that's exactly where its strengths lie. The film focuses on a group of paranormal investigators trying to discover the mystery of a haunted house in a neighbourhood of Buenos Aires and while it's wrapped up neatly as a classic haunted house story, it also becomes so much more than that. Clearly this film was made by fans of horror cinema and it pulls out pretty much every trick in the book, but it's also gleaned with an absolutely terrifying eye for horror. Terrified will make your skin crawl and if you've got a smidgen of morbid humour, you'll probably find parts of this film hilarious too. Coming in next at number 4, The Burrowers, 2008. Ah! Why 
to bury her alive? I don't know. And no, not The Borrowers starring John Goodman because that would be a whole different level of spooky. Now, I might be biased because I love westerns and 2008's The Borrowers is, well, a horror set in the Wild West, which granted might put you off from the beginning, but as far as period piece horror mashups go, this one's probably at the top of the pile. It's difficult to balance a politically relevant western period drama with a classic horror creature feature, but that's exactly where JT Petty's The Borrowers shines. The film focuses on a group of pioneers in 1879 who venture through the Dakota territories trying to build a new life during the flood of western settlers. If you're a fan of the early noughties, The Burrowers has a cast jam-packed of genre actors who never really had their time to shine, but really get their chance to here. William Mapotha, Laura Layton, Sean Patrick Thomas and the unstoppable juggernaut that is Clancy Brown. Also, the most important point to note in The Burrowers is that the monsters are absolutely awesome and as far as creature feature goes, this one delivers it in spades. Next up at number three, Little Otik, 2000. And where the hell do I even begin with this film? I know I say that a lot, but perhaps the most fitting example of that phrase is this film. Way back in the day when I was taking film class at college, we were studying European surrealism, and this film just so happened to rock up one day on my watch list, and still to this day, I think back at how utterly messed up it is. But don't get me wrong, this film isn't messed up in the sense of, say, a Serbian film. This film is messed up because it's just so strangely weird, bizarre, not quite like anything you've ever seen or will see. It's not even a horror film. In fact, it's pretty damn hilarious in places, but trust me, Little Otik is a horror experience. Written and directed by the legendary surrealist Jan Svankmeyer, Little Otik is a Czech film based upon the Otisanic fairy tale from 19th century Czechoslovakia. And what's that, you may ask? Well, Otisanie is a dark European cautionary folk tale about a couple that have been struggling to conceive a child together. One day out in the fields, the husband finds a strange log of wood that curiously resembles the figure of a baby, and so he decides to bring it home to his wife. The couple are completely overjoyed by their new wooden child and suddenly that log baby comes to life and demands to be fed. But then as time passes the baby can't stop eating and Otisanya gets hungrier and hungrier and you can see where this is going, right? Little Otik is incredibly straightforward with its narrative but Jan Svankmeyer manages to squeeze every last terrifying and intriguing drop out of this fairy tale. He blends strange twisted stop motion animation with live action set pieces and this film really is a feast for your eyes. Although it isn't a traditional horror film so to speak. If you haven't seen Little Otik, please do, because you won't be forgetting it in a hurry. Swinging in at number two, November 2017. <laughs> this film is beautiful and sick and twisted and brilliant and everything you could ever want from a horror fantasy based on folklore because it's a hodgepodge of all of those things woven beautifully in those same surreal dark tones of northern Europe. This film shot way way under the radar and admittedly it may be a little too art house for some people but forget about that because visually speaking from a horror perspective this film is worth so much. There's nothing like it. It's exciting and it's brilliant and films like this as well as Robert Eggers' The Witch are important and entries into both folklore and horror cinema. Written and directed by Raina Sarnet, November is an Estonian dark fantasy horror based upon the novel Rehepap Ek November by Andrus Kirivak, which is essentially a modern grim fairy tale about the price of young love and the dangers that come with it. Aren't they all, eh? Set in a small 19th century village in Estonia that is unwittingly besieged by every magical creature in the forest, spirits, wood elves, trolls, gnolls, and even the devil himself, the folklore elements of November are juxtaposed by a very real historical reality. You see, the town is also besieged by the Black Death, the plague, and the church are trying their utmost to save some souls. Behind that, though, is the backdrop of a young love triangle trying their best to circumvent each other's heart's desires in the classic cautionary fashion that we all expect. I don't say this lightly, but this film is Shakespearean. There's so much calamity going on that it's almost like a horror depiction of a Midsummer Night's Dream, and it lends itself perfectly to the ingenuity of Baltic folklore and literature. Despite that, though, November also crams in all the dirt, grime, and the very physical gore of pain and existence out in the rural mire of 19th century Europe and that alone makes it worth a watch. This film is brilliant. Give it a watch. And finally coming in at our number one spot, Sauna 2008. Let me 
preface this with a very important point. This film is hella messed up and you will either love this film or you will hate it. It's as simple as that. But the reason this film takes our number one spot, despite me being a massive fan of it, is down to its no nonsense approach to the stark realities of folklore and the price of human life that is often paid in its cautionary tales. 2008 Sauna does not pull any punches. It doesn't sugarcoat the realities of death with the magical or mystical and because of that it's perhaps one of the starkest interpretations of myth and legend of recent times. Sauna otherwise known as filth or evil rising in its English release tells the tale of two brothers in Finland in 1595. It takes place at the end of the bloody Russo-Swedish war and the brothers, one of them a violent and grizzled warrior and the other a kind and timid scholar, are tasked with marking the new border between Finland and Russia. So what does a sauna have to do with it? Well, I'll leave that for you all to discover because part of the appeal of this film is pulling at the thread of its mystery. But heading into this film you may need to know, although it may not seem like it, the folklore connotations of one of Scandinavia's most ancient pastimes, the steamed hut and novels of a sauna play a very significant and horrifying role in this film. There are so many tales throughout Finnish folklore about the dangers of meeting mischievous figures behind the ancient myths of a sauna, but this film is instead concerned with its surprising spiritual connection and the role it played in the cleansing of sins. You may have to dig deep into this film to truly understand its significance to folklore, but put it this way, the Sami people of northern Finland were one of the last bastions of ancient paganism and remained unconverted by Christianity until the 18th century. Keep that thought in your head and then watch this film. I'll say no. Kicking off at number five, Men Behind the Sun, 1988. <laughs> And to say that this film cut a little too close to the bone is putting it lightly, because it didn't. It straight up hacked an arm off. And while when you understand the controversies of the film's narrative, you can see exactly why. Men Behind the Sun is a 1988 exploitation horror film directed by T.F. Mao that graphically depicts the historical war atrocities committed by the Imperial Japanese Army at Unit 731 during the Second World War. It was the first ever film to be given a level 3 rating by the Hong Kong Censorship Board, although some dispute whether it should have even been rated at all. Because of its wildly graphic content, this film was just flat out banned by everyone and everything after its limited release. And although Mao claimed that he was trying to depict historical accuracy, that message kind of got shoved into a blender and buzzed down into a smoothie that missed the point. In fact, it caused so much outcry in Japan that TF Mao received numerous death threats years after its release. For the most part, that was down to an extremely controversial scene that Mao claimed was actual autopsy footage of a young boy, and another scene where a live cat appeared to be eaten alive by hundreds of of frenzied rats, which were then later set on fire. Yeah, not too sure about this one. Coming in at number four, Blood Sucking Freaks, 1976. Whew, buddy, where do we even begin? What makes this film all the more unstomachable is that following its original release, it was marketed as a horror comedy. Although there isn't a lot of comedy to it, really, or tragedy, it's just kind of flat and bleak and doesn't really offer a lot of anything other than a million and one different methods of on stage torture. Originally shot under the title of Sadhu, Master of the Screaming Virgins and then retitled to The Incredible Torture Show, before settling on the distribution title of Blood Sucking Freaks, the history of its namesake pretty much sums up its content. It's confused, at best. But despite the non-stop gross out tactics that Blood Sucking Freaks deployed, it was the events that unfolded after the film's release that cemented it eternally in the upper echelons of cult classic exploitation cinema. The film's main character, the violent and depraved Dr. Sadhu, played by Seamus O'Brien, was stabbed to death by a burglar in his own apartment shortly after the film's release. Not only that, but model Viju Krem, who plays the character of Natasha Di Natalie, was shot and killed during a hunting accident several years later. Both of their tragic deaths only added to the cult status of blood-sucking freaks, further contributing to the film's legendary notoriety. Next up at number three, Possum, 2018. And now we're really talking, my word, this film is creepy. Now, let's segue things, because as a Brit, I've got to make a note that we do bleak atmospheric isolation really, really well in cinema. It's our thing, you know, it's always raining, the sky is grey most of the time, and it has historically reflected so in film. 
well, possum is exactly that. And if you're not in the game of feeling deeply unsettled, I'd avoid this film because I warn you, it's going to stick with you. Also, it was written and directed by the trailblazing Matthew Holness, who also made one of the greatest and weirdest British comedies ever, Garth Marenghi's Dark Place. Possum covers some tough themes, which bleed throughout the plot in a kind of atmospheric oppression. It stars Sean Harris, a fantastic British actor who plays the part of Philip, a disgraced children's puppeteer trying to piece his life back together while also confronting the demons of his past. And also, if you have a fear of the uncanny puppets, mannequins, whatever, Possum will make you feel very, very scared. I don't want to ruin anything, but it has one of the most unsettling scenes I've seen in quite a while. You'll know it when you see it. Give it a watch. Swinging in at number two, Ghost Stories, 2018. Now, I know for certain that if you guys haven't yet seen 2018's Ghost Stories, then you will absolutely love it. Who would have guessed that one of the smartest horror movies of 2018 would have Martin Freeman in a supporting role, eh? Not me. But yet, here we have it, written and directed by the awesome British duo Andy Nyman and Jeremy Dyson. Ghost Stories is based on the duo's 2010 stage play of the same name. It follows the story of Philip Goodman, played by Nyman, a famous television professor renowned for debunking psychics and paranormal events. What plays out a three separate ghost stories intended to make a believer out of Goodman, and that's just the beginning. It's kind of reminiscent of The Twilight Zone and Tales from the Crypt, and if you're a fan of anthology horror, then you'll definitely be a fan of ghost stories. Although the intelligence of this film relies on its ability to wrap the whole thing up, and it more than delivers so in its final act. The most important thing to note about ghost stories is that it's, well, it's fun. It's an entertaining film, and it never lets up with the creepy, crawling sense of British horror dread. Its cast is stacked. Martin Freeman, Paul Whitehouse, and Alex Lawther of Black Mirror fame. Yeah, maybe I'm overstamping the British horror vibe, but this film deserves to be up there with the best of the best. And finally, our number one spot, The Endless, 2018. Seriously now, horror fans, this film is incredible. And when I say incredible, I mean that it's one of the smartest, freshest, most inventive pieces of horror cinema I've seen in a long, long time. If you're a fan of the themes that we tend to cover here at Top 5 Scary Videos, Lovecraftian literature, cosmic horror, the weird, perplexing realm of the occult and its mysteries, then you will find a home with The Endless. I will also go so far as to say this film is a horror masterpiece. There, we have it. The cat's out the bag. Written and directed by Justin Benson and Aaron Moorhead, who also start in the film and so comprise the believable framing device that makes up the first curious steps into the film's increasingly bizarre plot. More than any film we featured on these lists, I don't want to spoil anything whatsoever with this film, so we'll leave it at that. But trust me, you'll have to watch it several times before you fully absorb its uneasy, perplexing nature. This film starts small and heads out into one of the most expansive journeys that horror cinema has been on in quite some time. And the whole thing was made on a shoestring budget. It just goes to show that with drive, originality, and boundless creativity can make a truly worthy horror film. Coming in at five, I Spit on Your Grave. Released in 1979 and directed by Miyazaki, I Spit on Your Grave is a rape and revenge horror film that tells the story of Jennifer Hills, a writer based in New York City who exacts revenge on each of her tormentors after four men gang rape her and leave her for dead. The movie is a violent slice of horror that was unsurprisingly met with fierce opposition upon its release. Critics such as Roger Ebert refer to it as, I quote, a vile bag of garbage without a shred of artistic distinction and attending it was one of the most depressing experiences of my life. He also went on to call it so sick, reprehensible and contemptible and he could barely believe it existed. However, it wasn't just movie critics who hated the movie, entire countries did as well. Canada initially banned the film, however they later allowed individual provinces to decide if it would be allowed within their borders during the 1990s. The UK would only allow the movie to be released in censored form, meaning severe cuts, whereas countries such as Norway, Iceland and West Germany at the time banned it outright on the premise that it supported violence against women. However, stranger still, the movie was only banned in Australia 20 years after its release. The ban was rescinded in 2004, however, but not all countries were as lenient, with the film still remaining banned in Ireland to this day. Coming 
in at four, Snuff. Released in 1976 and directed by Michael Finley, Snuff is a splatter film that is most notorious for being marketed as if it were an actual snuff film. The plot itself revolves around actress Terry London and her producer Max Marsh, who visit an unnamed country in South America. A female biker cult led by a man named Satan stalks and eventually murders the pregnant London and her circle of friends. The movie is very Manson Family esque before quickly switching gears and becoming a documentary of a young woman being killed. By the film's crew. Now, this movie actually has an interesting backstory. Michael Finley went down to Argentina to shoot a quick and dirty movie that would ultimately cash in on the Helter Skelter craze, titling it Slaughter. However, the movie was unreleasable, but the then distributor Alan Shackleton had the idea of filming a fake killing, tacking it on the end of the movie and creating rumors that this was the real deal, a real snuff film. So, to double down on the urban legend, they renamed the movie Snuff and then hired fake protesters to pick it in front of theatres. It eventually got to the point that the New York's district attorney considered prosecuting a theatre owner who was showing it. However, Variety were the first to expose the movie and its publicity stunts as hoaxes. This is the true story of four innocent young actresses who thought they were making just another movie, but didn't know they were making the ultimate movie. Swinging in at number three, The Wailing. Oh man, is this film good. South Korean cinema just can't seem to make a bad horror film. And at the top of that pile is The Wailing, written and directed by Na Hong Jin. In essence, this film is about spiritual belief and the inner conflict of the soul. It weaves differing competing threads of spiritualism throughout. Shamanism, ritualistic sacrifice and even Christianity boiled down further, good and evil, angels and demons. Which one ends up on top? Well, if you watch the film, you'll find an answer of your own. What you will find though is an occult masterpiece into the weird world of Korean folklore. This film does a pretty stand-up job at keeping you on edge throughout its lengthy two and a half hour runtime, feeding you tiny scraps of narrative right up until the very end. Also, we haven't even talked about the murder, demon, zombies, or the exorcism, or the cave scene. Yeah, I really don't want to ruin this film for you if you haven't seen it, but take it from me, it's worth the nightmares. Coming in next at number two, The Babadook. If it's in a word or it's in a look, you can't get rid of The Babadook. Are you terrified of creepy shadow monsters that lurk behind your wardrobe door? Then please sit down in a dark room and watch The Babadook, a 2014 Australian psychological creature feature from Jennifer Kent. I say creature feature in the loosest sense because, guys, seriously, what the hell is The Babadook? I still don't know, and it's got me pretty shook. That, in essence, is the success of this film, though. The fear of the unknown, the strange, otherworldly sense that you get as a child trying to fall asleep in a bleak, unfamiliar house. It blends the super natural with the surreal with a pinch of native Australian folklore to boot. Plus also, if you're a fan of the kid fighting back against the monster, then you'll be thrilled at six year old Samuel played by Noah Wiseman who absolutely steals the show. I appreciate that people have tried to find further meaning in this film's plot, its ending in particular, and while I think that there are wider cinematic elements that tie this film's plot together, without all of that, it's just a gut wrenching, knees weak, palm sweaty kind of horror movie. You know, the best kind. It's a suspenseful, slightly off story about confronting the darkness that lies within. And finally, at our number one spot, The Witch. You know what? I get it if you don't like this film. I understand the criticism that it received, but let me tell you, you're wrong, because this film is possibly the most unnervingly, unexplainably, brilliantly strange piece of horror cinema of recent times. It ticks every box on my list, and I'll tell you why. This film is impossibly bleak. It plays like something forbidden, something that we just shouldn't be watching, a glimpse into the long forgotten world where the devil still reigns. It begins with the banishment of a New England family in the 16th century, where we briefly get a glimpse of colonial era society and a newly found North America. But that world is soon shut off, and all we're left with is the woods and the witch. Seriously, this film does so much with so little that it's testament to Robert Eggers, the director and writer, as this was his first debut film, and he's fastly becoming my favourite horror filmmaker, so keep your eye out on him. Again, I really don't want to spoil this film for you, but if you laugh at the idea of being terrified of a goat, then let me introduce you to Black Phillip. Remove thy shoe. 
this. Come in at five. Good night, mummy. This Austrian horror was released back in 2014 and follows twin boys who move to a new home with their mother who has just undergone a face changing cosmetic procedure following an accident. What makes this film terrifying as an audience member is that we're never quite sure what is happening, let alone what is real and what is not. The twins develop a form of Capgras syndrome, a syndrome which makes them believe their mother has been replaced by an imposter. The film begins as a slow burn as the twins investigation stems from a curious nature before it turns into something far more cruel and horrific, which quickly divides us as an audience, conflicting us as we wonder whether we should be rooting for the twins or the mother. What sets this film apart from the rest of our list is that the film has no surprises. It's not filled with jump scares or twists and turns, it's in the purest sense horror, as we watch innocent young children do unspeakable things. It's an uncomfortable watch, but a masterclass in horror nonetheless. Good night, mummy. Check it out. Come in at four, you're next. What is that? This home invasion horror was released back in 2011 and follows the Davison family as they come under attack during their anniversary getaway. A gang of mysterious masked killers storm the house, but very quickly learn that one of the victims harbors a very special set of skills, making her perhaps one of, if not the greatest final girls of all time. Now, Your Next is the perfect result of an often mishandled storyline. We've seen it before, innocent families tormented by killers, but Your Next is different, so incredibly different. As the family sit and spat at the dinner table, they're very quickly interrupted by said killers, which sets off an all night bloodbath. However, what sets this film apart from the rest is that it strays away from the tropes of the home invasion subgenre, and instead gives us with Erin, played by Shani Vinson, a character who is the furthest thing from a victim we have perhaps ever seen in the genre. She fights back against the intruders, showing us that it is not her first rodeo. She is highly trained in fighting and survival skills. Erin is not to be messed with, and neither is your next. Watch it, you'll not regret it. Next up, our number three Serbian film, 2010. Oh boy. I'm not gonna lie, guys, I tried to keep this film far, far away from this list, but eventually it's clear there's no denying this fact. 2010's A Serbian Film is one of the most widely controversial movies ever made. And rightly so, because if you've seen a Serbian film, you know that seeing it once is one time too many. The thought of watching this film again actually makes me slightly anxious, and if that's not too real, I'm not entirely sure what is. The film itself was investigated in Serbia for crimes against sexual minors and crimes related to the protection of minors, bagging the film's writers and directors several court appearances, all of which were later unfounded. Now, don't get me wrong, I kind of wanted to give this film the benefit of the doubt after hearing that it had much more allegorical themes to it than and first met the eye. But all of that pretty much goes out of the window after the second act, and any artistic merit that this film had just slowly crumbles in front of your eyes in an even more depressing turn of events. The closing few moments of this film are some of the most mentally scarring scenes I have ever witnessed in cinema. Straight up, brutally honest. And that's alongside several other scenes that already give this film the notoriety it's gathered. You might think that you want to watch a Serbian film. Trust me, you don't. Save yourself the trauma. Swinging in at number two, Salo or the 120 Days of Sodom, 1975. Le creature incatenate, destinate al nostro piacere. Spero non vi siate illusi di trovare qui la ridicola libertà concessa dal mondo esterno. Okay, the flip reverse of a Serbian film, and something that very much manages to successfully garner artistic credit. But also, I don't say this lightly, it's still messed up. Really, really messed up. As director John Waters said, Salo is a beautiful film. It uses obscenity in an intelligent way, and it's about the pornography of power, which is pretty spot on, really. Written by Sergio Citi and directed by Pier Paolo Pasolini, Salo is loosely based on the book The 120 Days of Sodom by the Marquis de Sade. Yet this time, it it's set during World War II in the fascist Italian Republic of Salo, focusing on four wealthy, corrupt Italian politicians that kidnap 18 teenagers.
teenagers and subject them to months of physical, sexual and mental torture. It was the public reception of this film where things became far too real though, being immediately banned in several countries following an investigation of graphic scenes of abuse against actors thought to be younger than 18 years of age. After its first underground screening in England at the Old Compton Street Cinema Club in Soho, London in 1977, the premises were actually raided by the Metropolitan Police after a bootleg copy of the film had been seized. Stories like this were pretty much commonplace up until the early 90s and in many ways Salo is perhaps one of the most controversial movies ever made. The weird fact that it's actually really good is exactly what Pasolini intended. I think. I hope. Yeah. And finally coming in at our number one spot, Faces of Death 1978. And there aren't really many clips I could possibly show of 1978's Faces of Death without getting this particular top 5 scary video flagged on all parts of algorithmic no-nos. Because well, Faces of Death was so real in the sense that it was for the most part literal footage of people dying. Yeah. Although several of the human death scenes shown in Faces of Death as well as a monkey being killed are obvious fakes, Alan A. Apone, the special effects artist for the movie, claimed that around only 40% of the film is fake. The rest is genuine footage and it's pretty harrowing stuff. Faces of Death is a curiosity piece. It was made with the purpose to shock and revolt its audience. But when we compare it to the majority of footage that is out there now on the internet floating around, it isn't exactly anything new. In 1978 though, oh boy was this film the edgiest damn thing you could ever get your hands on. Yeah, I don't really have much more to say on this one, 104 minutes of people dying, most of it is very much real, it made 35 million dollars at the box office, yeah, faces of death. Kicking off at number 5, The Hallow. As you may know, I'm a huge proponent for British horror, mainly because the only thing we've really got to do over there is look out at a grey sky through a rainy window and well, it makes for some pretty terrifying horror cinema. No more so than in 2016's The Hallow, written and directed by Corin Hardy, the man recently responsible for The Nun. Also if you're a fan of Game of Thrones then this film stars both Joseph Maul aka Benjamin Stark and Michael McEl Hatton aka the brilliantly morose Roose Bolton. Great stuff. The Hallow plays out as a folklore tale of old, a family from the city, a newborn baby and a malevolent creature out in the deep dark wood with strange twisted intentions. It's also a breath of fresh air from the cookie cutter creature feature that we see in modern cinema and the departure from full blown CGI with instead using old school practical effects make for some terrifying on screen moments, bringing creatures from Irish folklore to a nightmarish reality. It's great, give it a watch. Coming in at number 4. The Omen. Ah, <sighs> jeez, this film. Admittedly, as I get older, the impact of The Omen becomes less and less, but there's no denying that Damien Thorne, aka the Antichrist himself, is one of the most demonically fear inducing kids to have ever stepped on screen. And the first time you see his twisty little smile is something that you'll never forget. <laughs> Here is wisdom, let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is 666. Pretty metal, right? Well, in essence, that's what Richard Donner's 1976 on screen demonic onslaught really is. It's a religiously charged, meandering tale that drags us along through the hallways of hell on earth. Now, I'm talking of the wider franchise in this case because the original film starring Gregory Peck is a much more subtle and creepingly quiet beast. The strange, spacious audio track, the wide lingering shots and an absolutely terrifying performance from a four year old boy Harvey Spencer Stevens. I wouldn't necessarily advocate saying a prayer before you watch this film but I wouldn't tell you not to either. Next up at number three, the Poughkeepsie tapes. When people think of serial killers they think of four or five people, you know, Ted Bundy, Dahmer, Gacy, etc. But what most people don't realise is how many more there are. An interesting film to say the least. Now. I'm not the biggest fan of fan footage horror and to be honest I'm not even the biggest fan of gore for the sake of gore and shock horror cinema. However there is one exception and I also think that this film gets unjustly labelled as torture porn because it's fundamentally not. It's a documentary about a serial killer and a twisted insight into the mind of a fictional mass murderer captured over 800 neatly organised videotapes dubbed the Poughkeepsie tapes. Written and directed by John Eric Dowdle this film was pretty much shelved by MGM 
time and never actually made it to mass distribution, which is the reason why it went underneath most people's radar. And it's kind of been a thorn in the side of horror cinema for quite a while, receiving scathing reviews from critics. For fans of horror cinema though, the Poughkeepsie tapes is worth a watch, simply because it's so fresh in its concept and it's a form that we rarely get to see done correctly in the genre. Also, it's really, really messed up. <laughs> Swinging in at number two, Eden Lake. As far as British horror cinema goes, from one Brit to the wider world, I really can't recommend this film enough. If you haven't seen it, go and watch it, because for a movie with an incredibly simple, straightforward plot, Eden Lake really makes you care about the consequences of its final outcome. And that, in essence, is what makes it so horrifying, because the consequences are really really rough. Also, it's got a youngish Michael Fassbender, so there's that. Released in 2008 and written and directed by James Watkins, Eden Lake tells a story of school teacher Jenny and her boyfriend Steve, played by Fassbender, as they take a quiet little vacation into the English countryside. Unfortunately for them though, there's a bunch of teenagers, and as we all know in horror cinema, one of those kids is bound to be a sociopath. Again, I don't want to spoil anything, so I'll leave it at that, but Eden Lake deals with some visceral themes, and the bleak level of violence creeps up on you quicker than a rabid Rottweiler. Definitely one that every horror fan needs in their repertoire. And finally, at our number one spot, the autopsy of Jane Doe. When we start something, we finish it. You want to leave? Leave. Going into this film, I had zero expectations, and considering it was pretty much a direct to Netflix feature, I was completely blown away by how damn good of a horror flick it is. I know I say this time and time again, but the difference between a well made, well handled, slow, supernatural horror compared to that of a gore fest patched together with some cheap tricks and CGI is massively important to the horror genre as a whole. Well, director Andrew Overdale definitely delivered on that benchmark, stating that he wanted to prove he could do more than found footage style horror after his critical success with Troll Hunter, which, if you haven't seen that either, see it, it's awesome. Two for one. The autopsy of Jane Doe is the story of a mysterious corpse and the slow unravelling of the causes of her death by father son mortician duo Austin and Tommy Tilden, played by Emile Hirsch and the awesome Brian Cox, respectively. This film also handles the paranormal in a very responsible manner. We're never expected to believe anything that isn't already alluded to in the film's plot. In essence, this is a very, very smart film. It's claustrophobic in all the right ways, it's disturbing and elegant, and it's a modern diamond in the rough for the genre. Honestly, give it a watch. Number five. I said, listen to me. I think everyone's dead. Pontypool. And really, the fact that Bruce McDonald's horror tour de force isn't heralded as one of the greatest zombie films ever made is a bit of an injustice. I say zombie film because that's the closest we'll ever get to understanding whatever virus plagues the unassuming town of Pontypool. Released in 2008, this Canadian horror film was based on the Tony Burgess novel Pontypool Changes Everything, the story of an Ontario based radio station that tries its hardest to keep broadcasting during a viral apocalyptic event. It follows the character of Grant Mazzy, played by the awesome Stephen McHattie, an opinionated and brash radio jockey that tries his damnedest to be as dismissive as possible when facing down the end of the world. While I might not have you hooked by saying this is essentially a horror film about the English language, the real reason to watch this film is because Pontypool is a completely different breed of zombie flick. In parts, it's hilarious. In others, it's horrifying. If you haven't seen it, give it a watch. You won't be disappointed. Coming in at number four, Kill List. Amen, Christian soldiers. You're giving me indigestion. Oh, um, I'm sorry. Apology accepted. The term folk horror isn't as commonplace as it should be in horror cinema, but it's a style that has slowly germinated in British cinema and is captured perfectly in the sweeping action horror from the fantastic Ben Wheatley Kill List. This film draws inspiration from some 70s horror classics such as The Witchfinder General, The Blood on Satan's Claw, and of course, The Wicker Man, in a period where, to be honest, British horror cinema had hit its peak. 
Now I'll admit that this film isn't for everyone, it's intentionally ambiguous and visually misleading, but if the idea of deranged cults flocking about in huge country manners makes your skin crawl, then you'll find true fear in this film, really because it delivers that in spades. Kill List features the show-stealing Neil Maskell, a disgustingly underrated actor who plays an ex-soldier turned contract killer, trying to make enough money to support his family in one final job. I don't want to spoil anything because Kill List really does keep you guessing all the way to the end, but the way it takes you there is what makes this film so damn thrilling. Give it a watch. Coming in at 3, Freaks. Classic horror doesn't get more classic than Todd Browning's 1932 masterpiece Freaks, a film which managed to slip by Hollywood censors in a brief period before the Code Authority years. The film follows a circus and its beautiful trapeze artist who agrees to marry the leader of the sideshow performers, but his deformed friends quickly discover she is only marrying him for his inheritance. Now this film features a phenomenal cast of real life sideshow performers, which is why the film itself following its release was banned in the UK for over 30 years. Yep, that's right, 30 years. Despite its age, Freaks is still one of the most disturbing and haunting horror films I've ever seen. Many other creators have been inspired by Todd Browning's work as well, such as Ryan Murphy who borrowed heavily from the movie for his carnival themed season of American Horror Story. Coming in at 2, The Woman in Black. Nathaniel? I'm so, so sorry guys, I hated to have to do that to you, but that scene just proves how absolutely terrifying the 1989 version of The Woman in Black is. For those of you who don't know, the film was directed by Herbert Weiss and is based on the book of the same name written by Susan Hill. It follows a young lawyer who was sent to settle the estate of an old widow who passed away in the seaside town of Crichton. The townspeople are reluctant to talk about or go near the woman's creepy home, and on top of that, no one will explain or acknowledge the menacing woman in black he keeps seeing. Ignoring the town, the lawyer goes to the house where he quickly discovers its horrible secrets. If you've seen the Daniel Radcliffe version, good for you, it's just not the best version. But don't worry, you can amend your mistakes by watching the superior 1989 classic. Do it. Just do it. And finally, coming in at number one, Carrie. Yes, 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 I know I said I wouldn't be picking obvious choices, but I can't not include Carrie and you know it. Directed by Brian De Palma and released back in 1976, Carrie follows the story of Carrie White, a shy, friendless teenage girl who was sheltered by her religious mother. However, after being humiliated at prom, Carrie unleashes her powers on her classmates and her town. Based on Stephen King's novel of the same name, Brian De Palma very successfully brought his work to life in a gutsy and cutting edge movie. At the time of its release, the cast were full of unknowns, including Sissy Basic, John Travolta, Nancy Allian, and William Katz. What makes this film so damn good is that it makes you feel everything. Pain for Carrie, horror at what she does to her classmates, and fear that we have spent an entire film rooting for the villain. Carrie is sensational and despite its age, still holds up. <laughs> 